Hi everybody, this is your host Nino, and I realize I know another weird creep movie featuring surveillance, namely Eye of the Beholder, but again, I did not like the story of it all too much, in particular the ending looked a little forced, however it might be closer to what we are doing as we are using more homemade gadgets, perhaps more similar to what Gene Hackman was doing in um, Enemy of the State or in that movie from the 70s where he's doing all this audio surveillance. Anyway, I am welcoming you here with to the second episode of Home Surveillance Systems, self-made of course, And here we are going to be using the ESP32 cam board, AI Thinker ESP32 cam it's called if you want to look for it. AI Thinker I find is quite a big name for something which is little more than just simply a a camera. And the sensor I will be featuring is based on the OV2640 cam as you can see here. This whole thing is minuscule and if you look for it on Amazon you will find it either as a separate board or as a board with a carrier. I definitely opted for the thing with a carrier but you when buying beware whether you will actually receive a fully working thing or just like this this upper part right so don't get tricked into buying just the one part if you actually wanted to get both which is uh, what i wanted to do now what are the particular advantages of using these things rather than the raspberry pi installation well the advantages are also innately connected to the disadvantages namely you can have a whole swarm of those things for the price of just one Raspberry Pi and I don't even want to publicly admit how many of these things I actually got. Now (laughs) evidently as this is just a microcontroller board rather than a full featured computer in a way what you can say that the Raspberry Pi is, um, this is way weaker so it takes images generally speaking with lower resolutions it can save fewer images and so forth but on the plus side this is like a swarm of things you can say that if if the raspberry pi is to make a starcraft comparison like like the protos this is definitely zerk material right you're attacking the problem with a million of little systems and for the purposes of testing i am using this cable but for deployment i will be using this which is many meters long and i should be able to reach even remote parts of the house with this What is, of course, a fact is that this experiment is standing on the shoulders of giants in that many people before me have greatly paved the way towards the success of this experiment. However, I have suitably extended things as well, of course. Uh, First and foremost, it should be mentioned that the entire setup will not depend on anything else. There are no extra motion detection sensors there's no peer like pir there is just just a camera pointing at a thing and noticing pictures changing or just shooting periodic pictures there is no further um, material required other than these things their cable and their power supply in the end Mm. so this is very cost effective compared to to the single point of failure style raspberry pi these things one or two of them can you know break down you can lose maybe i don't know 20 30 percent of your of your deployed cameras but you might still be able to have a complete picture of affairs as usual for me i am of course taking multiple steps to to ensure that they will run for a long time in particular based on 
permanently restarting the device. More on that later, but uh, just like with the Raspberry Pi, don't trust a consumer grade Thingy to work for three months. Trust that it will work for a couple of hours and that then you can restart it. So that is how this whole operation will be based. We will be restarting them periodically and we'll be taking images with them. But now as opposed to the other tutorials, you will learn here how to send multiple images per email. That is, you have tutorials where each time an image is taken and then sent by email. No, we will be sending several of them. And like at once, which will be safer for you in order to have more continuous operation instead of a million emails. <laughs> and the other thing is that um, there is a very good example how to send pictures over Telegram using the motion detection library, but I don't like Telegram. So I'll be just using it through email. I'm more of an email guy, a little more old fashioned here perhaps, but definitely uh, email is the classical gateway for me to the outer world. And yeah, if you would like to have such a sort of deployment of perhaps a couple of these, then do go ahead. This is comparatively easy to set up, as you will see in a moment. Just four values need to be set up. And without further ado, I shall now guide you through the configuration. Evidently, in the end, I will be putting my sketches, my Arduino sketches of how to do this on GitHub. So in case you are just lazy and disinterested, <laughs> which I am mostly, then you don't even need to go through everything and you can just adjust your four values and flash it and enjoy life as an all-seeing. I. <laughs> All right, now come a couple of remarks regarding configuration. Again, there are two possible configurations. One is to let the system react on movement. The other one, let it just take pictures due to the sheer passage of time. I shall commence the explanations with the one relating to motion detection. To this, let me initially already thank very heartily both Simone from Italy, a brilliant guy who created the eloquent Arduino library, which we shall be using for the motion detection part, as well as Mobist, a developer who provided us with the ESP32 mail client library. Now don't be surprised, he has updated that library and there are two different versions of it. I'm using the somewhat older one, but you can, if you like, uh, you know, write things according to the new one if, if that is your preference. But this works for me and I saw no reason to switch. So, what do you need to set up in order to have motion detection and pictures sent to you. In fact, only four things. Your Wi-Fi name, your Wi-Fi password, your actual Gmail address, or you know, you can set up everything here according to some different provider, but I am here using Gmail as an example. And I suggest to set that also as the recipient of the email so that it doesn't look that much like spamming to Gmail, but that it looks more like someone writing notes to him or herself. And that way being less at risk of having your account blocked by Gmail, which has happened to me in the past because they were like, it looks like an automatic transmission. Oh, well, you bet it looks. <laughs> that, that's exactly the purpose of it. It is an automatic transmission. Now, one important part. You need here the Gmail app password. This is not your regular email password, Google app password, you'll see what I mean. This is a particular password which, G which Google will provide you with within Gmail in order to have apps like Outlook and uh, Thunderbird and so on fetch your emails. They have, for whatever reasons of imagined security, uh, set up things that way. And 
the, the point of this is that you need to enable two-factor authentication in order to be able to use the app password. I mean, I don't blame them. I understand that if you're having some insecure email uh, fetching method and somebody, a uh, man in the middle is you and, and gets your password, then things can become pretty nightmarish for you. So if they force you to enable two-factor authentication, at least they, they sort of know um, that, that you pay a bit more attention to who or what is actually using your password. And having a separate one from your main password actually prevents uh, simply locking you out of your account. But it also means this isn't something you know, it means this is something you have to get. And these four values are everything you need to set. The rest works by itself. I shall quickly give you an overview of it, but even without the overview and without any second of interest by yourself, you would be already getting emails that way. Now, we are of course now binding in all our libraries. Pictures will be saved on the internal ESP32 file system called SPIFs. Now, the other option would be evidently an SD card, but SD cards have proven finicky in my experience because they sometimes have synchronization delays and whatnot. So I don't really want to be dealing with them now. I would prefer something as simple and encapsulated as possible. And moreover, while they offer you an advantage in space, you are still operating with a comparatively very weak system. So working on less data is actually not a disadvantage, trust me. Now, the thing you need to select is what sort of image would you like to have? And the camera I have selected is this AI Thinker one because I'm having a board which is called uh, AI Thinker ESP32 Cam with an, uh, let me look at it again, OV2640 sensor like camera. So uh, you have to set up here whatever you find useful, but these are definitely extremely popular, popular as of late in my experience. Now Simone has uh, an interesting strategy of comparing movement, basically uh, of detecting movement. Basically he does what everybody else is doing, namely to um, everybody else is doing who is reasonable about it and doesn't require a million other devices with which to detect movement. Yeah, he's just simply comparing pixel changes. So he's saying how many percent of the image changed to what degree and uh, if these limits have been cross then motion is detected. But very correctly he says you don't actually need to compare the entire image. How about just decreasing your image into a thumbnail and comparing the changes on the thumbnail which is going to be way faster. I must say that's the right decision. That That's actually a very good idea. Pictures are shot in black and white like in grey but that does not harm the supervision purposes here. And well, I <laughs> created here, you see, I had a little bit of an issue with transmitting each picture as it is shot. The thing is, this, these would be way too many emails and very likely your account will get eventually blocked. So in order to not have that, I created a function copying files here in order to basically t take a picture but then copy it and only after a certain count of pictures have been created is an email actually sent. So <laughs> that's very much like the example in motion, like when I showed you motion and motion.conf on Linux, you do not send every email and thereby you save a bit on emails and you gain a little bit of safety that you won't be deemed a sort of, I don't know, self spammer. So yeah, then we're having here the function to send the emails. Basically, I just overtook here quite exactly an example with one um, specialty, namely that the 
various emails are attached here. Image A is the image which the system is always taking and then it arranges everything in an oldest to newest fashion, right? A will be the newest image, B will be the second newest and so on until image P which will be the oldest image taken. So first it copies A to P, then it copies A to O, then it copies A, a to N and so forth until in the end when it is just A it doesn't copy it anymore and that just remains as the newest picture. Now, you know, after sending the email you yeah, you're done. Uh, the one thing which I have inserted everywhere where I found it sort of dangerous to hang on an error is to end the file system's activity and to restart the chip. So that is following the principle which I already mentioned to you to not rely on the uptime of the device. To assume the device is finicky and unreliable and rather restart it often in order to make sure that any mistakes will be restarted away like lost upon the restart rather than trying to keep some crummy board up for four or six months or a year or something like that. So nearly every mistake in my code triggers a restart. Then we are having here pretty much uh, Simone's code for capturing uh, the image and you know if it uh, doesn't work then then you know <laughs> ESP restart. Things are going that way. We are disabling the brownout detector sometimes it gets a bit in the way and when the board starts, the SPIFS file system is automatically formatted. So anything residual from before will or should rather be erased. I have figured out that sometimes that does not work all that well and that despite formatting not the entire file system is available. So sometimes don't be surprised I demand two formats. In particular if I realize that snapshots have been taken and, and some reboot is happening after sending an email I am formatting it twice just to make sure that this is actually going to be accepted. And yeah, you cannot connect to the VP restart. You cannot activate the camera, restart. <laughs> and yeah, that, that's pretty much, pretty much it in the setup. Then regarding camera capture, we're trying to capture things. If it doesn't work out, we restart. If it does work out, then the image is being resized and motion detection is being called. And if we have indeed motion detected, then the file will be copied. Just as I described previously, first to P, then to O, then to N, and so forth. Until in the end, A is evidently copied nowhere, and we're just going to send the image. Now, one possible thing to do here is to actually restart the machine after sending the image. I think I might add that after having done this video with you, so don't be surprised if I insert here an optional line of doing so. You don't necessarily have to, but the file system becomes or this this joke of, of something like a file system becomes ever more unreliable. Basically the ESP internally doesn't really have a very proper file system but it saves data blocks and when you save a later one all previous ones have to be walked through. This manifests itself, itself in saving pictures ever more slowly. Like about the first dozen ones it saves pretty well and afterwards the functions of saving images, like of copying the image to somewhere, are ever slower and slower exponentially. And uh, of course you can say that uh, you might wish periodic images to be taken too. So that's pretty much all there is to it if you want to use the motion detecting one. Now let's have a look at the other variant which is simply sending things periodically. There I uh, copied a different example basically but 
again directing it to the AI thinker, the AI thinker ESP32 cam which I'm having. So yeah, if you have some other example then then good luck with that. <laughs> but but the, this one should should be easily available frankly. So yeah, again the same show as previously. We are all the time saving the image XA. This time it just has an X in front of the letter, just so I more easily distinguish them because I'm sending them to the same email address actually. And the same story happens as previously where I am slowly copying them, you know, into into different other image names until I reach in this case image R upon which I will send the email. Again in order to use that you only need to set up the four values as previously your Wi-Fi name, Wi-Fi password, Gmail address and your app password. So this is actually extremely similar and the only thing which is different is that like significantly different is that you are no longer looking much at motion detection, like that does not play a role here at all, but you merely have here a delay loop where the delay is each time one minute, the loop counter is growing and every 10 minutes an image is caught. Because I'm doing things up to R, I'm getting 18 images, which means when I reach R three hours have passed. So you're getting an image every 10 minutes and after three hours images are simply transmitted. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much all to it. So it is actually simpler than the other one. Works a little different but um, from the user perspective also so to say nothing too complex. Now one thing you you perhaps have a little bit more liberty in is selecting the size of the image. Because I am not using here Simone's eloquent library, I actually have the option to use higher resolutions. So Simone is basically having his images end at VGA, whereas here there are also bigger images available. Indeed the camera could take up to, to 1600 times 1200 but it becomes then difficult to store them because these things are rather large. So SVGA is working um, acceptably for me and it's also not black and white. So because images are more foreseeable in, in the amount, it is also easier for you to get more high quality images. Though the other ones aren't actually bad and I would say both are perfectly usable. Of course you might have questions of what does it all look like. All that I shall of course show you. Here are just a couple of pictures from my kitchen. Now they are not exactly sharp because I was holding the camera and waving it around. I mean how do you think am I going to simulate motion? I'm not going to dance in front of it. So that is one, that's another. Uh, here you can see through the window. <laughs> my marvelous fridge. <laughs> yeah, a little bit chaotic of course because I'm now in a sea of wires trying to figure out the specifics of my system which I'm going to use later on. But as you can see it's actually a reasonable quality. This is, this is not bad at all. And yeah, that's yours truly. So that's pretty much it for today. I guess you have now a clear impression on how to configure your ESP32 camera system. I would say from the user perspective that's likely the easier option. You really just need four values to have it set up. You just need to overcome the innate fear of microcontrollers. And with that I thank you very much for joining in. I hope this will be useful to you in one way or the other. I hope to greet you here soon again. I wish you a wonderful evening. And from me, goodbye.